Hello, uh, my name is uh, Sheila Sheth, and I'm uh, today going to discuss uh, ultrasound contrast uh, principle and applications. So ultrasound contrast agents are a new exciting development that we can start using here in the United States, and uh, they basically are microspheres, and the ones that are approved uh, for a contrast for the liver and some other application in the United States are uh, uh, called Lumison by Bracco. And basically what they are is they are uh, microbubbles who contain inert uh, low solubility gas, so usually sulfur hexafluoride, which is contained within the uh, phospholipid shell, which give them some stability. They're very small diameters, um, as you can see here, uh, and therefore they can easily pass through the lung capillaries. So when they are injected intravenously in the circulation, they stay in the capillary bed. And an important, to, important thing to realize is that they remain intravascular, on, unlike um, you know, CT or MR contrast. So there is no interstitial or equilibrium phase, but they do remain intravascular for several minutes. And uh, finally, they are ex excreted by the lungs after several minutes. So how do they work? Well, those microbubbles are echo enhancers, and this is due to change in acoustic impedance between the bubbles and the blood. And those microbubbles, when they are insulated, they resonate or oscillate, and they are nonlinear reflectors, uh, and they uh, oscillate at the fundamental frequency, but also at multiple harmonics of the fundamental frequency. And of course, uh, as we go up in the harmonics, there is decreasing uh, intensity. So the normal image at the uh, second harmonics, which gives you enough intensity to be able to detect it. Now, another important uh, technical point is that when we image those microbubbles, we need to image at low mechanical index to avoid uh, rapid bubble destruction. So how do we do it? So we image at the second harmonic, as I said, and we use a pulse inversion uh, imaging technique, which I'll discuss uh, in a minute. Uh, and that allows us to image only the bubbles and not the surrounding tissue. So it's so, so, like a, a subtraction technique, and it, this allows to improve a signal to noise ratio. Uh, and we can do the subtraction technique when we image uh, uh, with pulse uh, inversion imaging because the bubbles have a nonlinear response at low MI, whereas tissue have linear response. So that allows us to visualize small vessels with very slow flow, and we can compare the acoustic uh, enhancement in the lesion or the area of interest to the surrounding tissue. So this is how a pulse inver inversion imaging recovery uh, works. So we send a normal pulse, and we send the inverted pulse. And then what is imaged is the sum of echoes. So because the tissues have a linear uh, response, then the sum of the echoes is zero, whereas the bubble have a nonlinear uh, response, and therefore they, 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 are, they have positive imaging and hence the subtraction technique. So the tissue without bubbles will appear black, and the bubbles will be able to see. So because of that, uh, we basically need to have um, you know, low we image at low MI, as you can see here, and we need a dual screen where you will have your grayscale image for reference, so we know what we're imaging, especially when we start, before the bubbles arrive in the tissue, this part of the screen will be completely black, and then we image the, the, this portion of the screen with the pause inversion uh, technique so that we can image the bubbles as they arrive. This patient had a, uh, you know, hypodense mass that was, you know, somewhat difficult to see, but really stands out uh, with contrast imaging, uh, as you can see here. And uh, this is the grayscale image. This is this patient CT scan again, showing a hypodense mass in the region of the uh, hepatic hilum, which was a cholangiocarcinoma. The patient also has some ascites, as you can see here. So what are the advantages of uh, ultrasound contrast agent? Well, they're not nephrotoxic, and they have a different algae profile than ionided agents. 
So in addition to that, they really allow real-time evaluation so we can see continuous visualization of small blood vessels throughout the injection cycle. Uh, there is a very high temporal resolution. Uh, unlike CT or MR, we can only image at certain given points in time. Here you can image continuously for several minutes. We also have a high spatial resolution, so we can see septation, small nodules. Of course, just like anything in ultrasound, there is no ionizing radiation. We can also perform multiple injections, at least two if needs to be. And in general, uh, they have a lower risk of major contrast reaction compared to the uh, CT or MR contrast agents. So there are some limitations, however. There are the same limitations as uh, ultrasound, so we need a good baseline exam. And really, if we don't have a good baseline exam with grayscale, then your imaging with contrast is not going to be that great because uh, the contrast cannot overcome the limitation of basic grayscale ultrasound. They do not, just like anything in ultrasound, we don't have global imaging, so we really need to focus on the region of interest. This cannot be used for full st body staging the way we can use CT or MR. It is operator dependent. And there are reimbursement issues, at least in the United States. And finally, uh, at this point, uh, at least in the adult, uh, I mean, in, for intravascular use, uh, FDA so far only has approved uh, contrast for ultrasound contrast for liver imaging, but many of us have included um, ultrasound contrast for off label use for many other applications, which I will be discussing. There are some contraindications. It used to be that cardiac shunts were a contra, intracardiac shunts were a contra, a contraindication. This now has been lifted, so it's no longer the case. Uh, there is an FDA black box warning uh, so that the patient, we require that the patient uh, stay 30 minutes uh, after contrast administration for observation, and you need to have uh, a, a crash card in the, in the area. And of course, the patient needs uh, an IV. Um, established before starting. So let's talk about general applications and then we'll go more into uh, specific applications. So um, it's used, it's, it's very, very useful for characterization of masses in patients who have renal insufficiency and therefore cannot have CT or MR contrast. It can also be used in patients who have um, allergy to uh, IV contrast and patients who cannot get uh, MR, for example. Uh, we've used it, and, and some others have used it as well, uh, for, in preparation for ultrasound gut biopsy. If there is a large mass that is necrotic, you can target the area of enhancement. Sometimes the lesion on grayscale may be difficult to see, and the contrast will help with lesion detection. Uh, it can be used for characterization of a lesion incidentally found on ultrasound. Uh, in patients who have known masses to, uh, for follow-up to limit the number of CT and MR. And finally, uh, you can also use it uh, to monitor response for chemotherapy in patients who have cancer, use a target lesion and see response to contrast to monitor response for chemotherapy. So how do we do it? So I'm, I want to give you some practical tips. So the first, uh, the first thing we do is you need to get a grayscale and color Doppler ultrasound for baseline. And as I said before, you need to have a good a grayscale baseline to make sure that you see the area of interest well. You also want to scan in a way that um, you can uh, have the lesion and the surrounding tissue for comparison because basically what you're doing is comparing the enhancement in the lesion to the enhancement of contrast in the surrounding tissue. Uh, you also want to able to be able to do it uh, where the patient has you know, quiet breathing because if you only see a lesion when the patient has to hold their breath, uh, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to, the patient wouldn't be able to do it for a very long time. So, you know, all these things you need to do, and you need to spend a lot of time before you start the contrast to make sure you have a base, good baseline uh, exam. Uh, we need an IV, as I said, and ideally you want at least a 20 gauge um, needle so that the bubbles, when they go through the needle, do not break. Uh, you need a three-way stopcock to, for the saline, saline flush. And, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. So, you know, you, the contrast comes in a little kit uh, where in the vial there is lyophilized powder and you have saline and you basically, you mix the saline with the contrast, agitate for at least 40 seconds to resuspend the bubbles. 
Uh, and then once the contrast is ready, you want to make sure that you select the contrast mode on your scanner. And so you need to have the software to be able to, 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 to do contrast imaging. Um, and uh, what we do is we inject a 2.4 cc of the microbarbell solution followed by a 5 cc saline flush. And we start real-time scanning and the timer with the start of injection. So, so really, it is a two people's job. One person is at the scanner, the other person is injecting. Uh, so this is what the setup would look like. So I st start, there's the same patient that are cholangiocarcinoma. So I start with a good grayscale imaging and I can see the lesion. I, I have enough surrounding liver tissue to be able to compare the uh, contrast within the lesion to the rest of the liver. And I also want to notice that when we go into contrast mode, which is here, because we're imaging at low MI, then the grayscale images is somewhat degraded. You, this, this is a much sharper image compared to this one. And so you, and then here's the uh, contrast image. So this is how the, the, your screen will be set up when you start contrast imaging. And of course, there is a timer that, you know, that, go, that, that is uh, you know, somewhere on the image so, so, so you can you know, time, see what's going on with time. So this is just how, you know, here's the bubble, the lyrophorous powder is here, uh, you're injecting the, uh, the, the, the flow, the saline here, oh, this is what it looks like, and then you start just agitating, and you just shake it with your hands, just like that. And then the result is this kind of milky powder. And you really have to shake it well for about 40 seconds. Uh, you want to make sure that the, power, power, the, that the con content of the, the, the um, vial here becomes milky. And then there is no residual. You know you've done a good job when there is no residual white powder at the bottom of the, the vial here. And then you withdraw the, the, the contrast in the syringe that is provided. And then here's the three-way stop. So uh, the IV uh, will go in the patient is connected that way. So another little tip is that you want to put your contract syringe straight so that the, the bubbles don't have to have this acute angle here. And you put your 5cc or 10cc saline flush here. So once you start, you start injecting. Once you've injected 2.4 cc's, you turn the stop, the stop, stop clock away from this area and towards this area, you inject 5cc, which is the saline push, which basically pushed a small amount of uh, contrast you've injected through the patient's IV into the patient. So let's talk about some applications now. And we'll talk about the liver, which is a very important application. As I said, this is the one that's FDA approved in the United States. Uh, and again, it's a, the indication that I've already discussed. So characterization of mass in patients with renal insufficiency or contrast allergy or in preparation for ultrasound-guided biopsy. It's also helpful for lesion detection or characterization of a lesion we found incidentally on ultrasound. Now, is that helpful for le lesion detection? It's kind of, you know... Uh, questionable. Now, the, the contrast does stay in the liver for about five to six minutes. So theoretically, you have time to scan the entire liver. Uh, and, you know, looking for liver metastasis for known malignancy. Uh, is that good enough for screening HCC? We don't have enough information yet to really answer this question. And again, monitor uh, response to patients who have uh, liver metastasis after chemotherapy. So let's review the uh, hemodynamics of contrast in the liver. So it's very similar to what we do in CT. So there is the hepatic arterial phase, which starts at approximately 10 to 20 seconds after the start of injection and lasts up to 40 seconds. This is followed by the portal venous phase, which uh, starts from 40 seconds to 120 seconds. And then there is a late phase of bubble clearance, and uh, you know the, the contrast will be in the liver for about five minutes. Now, remember, unlike CT or MR, there is no interstitial phase, and the contrast stays, the bubbles stay all the time in within the liver vasculature. So here's an example of a relatively normal liver. So this was a 30-year-old, eight-year-old male who had acute liver injury, and li his liver was very heterogeneous and was unclear whether this was just, you know, because of his acute liver injury or potentially could have mass. So I'm just going to fast forward this uh, video clip a little bit. 
And here you will start, this is your gel phase. Okay, you can see contrast going within the, the hepatic artery here. And as we keep going, we're moving to the portal venous phase when there is now very good enhancement of the entire liver parenchyma. Because remember that 75% of the blood flow to the liver comes through the portal vein. So this is now portal venous phase. And you can see the liver parenchyma and the vessels within it. And you can see here that this is homogeneous enhancement of the entire area. So this was just a heterogeneous liver, but without focal masses. So let's talk about some benign liver lesions. So hemangiomas are very uh, common. Uh, typically on ultrasound, they are present as a well-defined echogenic mass. Uh, and occasionally though, you can have an atypical presentation. So this, this patient where there is a hypoechoic mass in the liver, but note that the border is echogenic. Okay, this is an atypical hemangioma. If this was tumor, usually in tumors, the peripheral the periphery of the tumor is hypoechoic, okay? Here, the periphery of the lesion is hyperechoic, okay? And just like what you see in CT, uh, you will have centripetal progressive enhancement with progressing filling in and nodular enhancement, and the lesion progressively will become either iso or more echogenic than the surrounding liver. And there is very importantly sustained persistent enhancement in the portal venous and delayed phase. So peripheral nodular enhancement that is progressive. So let's uh, look at an example. So this is a patient who is 46 years old, has an incidental mass found on right upper quadrant ultrasound. And if you look at the mass here, it's a good location for hemangioma, good appearance, well-defined echogenic mass. And so instead of recommending some other imaging, we can, you know, quickly, we, we inserted an IV, injected contrast, and this is what we see. So I've, I've just had a video clip of selected images, but when you start here, maybe I will show the, slow the clip a little bit, you had see that you have nodular peripheral enhancement that is increasing as time goes on. Okay, so this is a typical appearance for a hepatic hemangioma that this patient did have a CT for some other reason later, and it confirmed that this indeed was a hemangioma. Another benign lesion that is found often incidentally is focal nodular hyperplasia, which is basically a pseudotumor, which is a normal liver surround surrounding an arterialized scar. Uh, it may be rather difficult to detect, at least on, on ultrasound on grayscale, uh, because it's you know normal liver parenchyma, so it has a, almost the same echo texture as the rest of the liver. But sometimes you can detect it if you see the central scar, as you can see here. So uh, this is a nice example on CT. Typically, uh, these uh, patients have uh, early arterial enhancement in the hepatic arterial phase. And you can have early arterial enhancement of the central scar. Sometimes you'll see a large feeding artery. And there is progressive central fugal enhancement. And then the enhancement persists in the portal venous phase. Um, and kind of at one time, will, one time will become iso intense to the rest of the liver. And very importantly, there is no D enhancement in the portal venous or late phase. So early arterial enhancement is very characteristic of these lesions. So this is an example from the literature showing intense arterial enhancement with a big feeding vessel here and the central scar. And I will show you an example that we had. Uh, this was a 47-year-old uh, woman, and you can see here that there is a, on the MR, um, this T1, T, I'm sorry, T2 bright lesion here with a suggestion of a central scar. Uh, it's on the uh, portal venous phase of the MR. It's iso intense to the liver. And so here uh, we did an injection. So we'll just look in this area here. So you can see that on the grayscale, we don't even see the lesion very well. I'm just going to advance the video clip a little bit. And here we'll start the arterial phase, the contrasty coming in. And look in this area. Okay, this is the arterial phase, and there is early arterial enhancement of this lesion way before there is enhancement of the rest of the liver. Okay, so this is, you know, brightly enhancing in the arterial phase, homogeneous lesion. 
Here in this particular case, we don't really see a central scar. And as we progress, we, we, we're starting the portal venous phase and you can see that the lesion now is you know, barely more enhancing than the rest of the liver. And if we pursue this, and usually in the liver, I will image up to five minutes to make sure there is, delay, there is no delayed de enhancement, then you can see that it becomes iso, iso dense or isoechoic to the rest of the liver. Another uh, benign tumor is adenoma, which are often heterogeneous because there is intratumoral bleeding. We all know that these are more common in, in women uh, who are taking oral contraceptive or sometimes male who will take anabolic steroids. So again, they're hypervascular on the RTL phase. There is centripetal feeling in on portal vein and delay phase. Uh, and typically, there will be no washout on the delayed phase, but some can have delayed washout, in which case they would not be able to be differentiated from hepatocellular carcinoma. Okay. Uh, another uh, lesion that can mimic, the pseudal lesion that can mimic a lesion, uh, focal mass, is focal fat. So this was a young boy that had, uh, you know, was kind of large and had this hyperechoic mass in the left hepatic lobe. Uh, and so, uh, you know, prior to, uh, to, to, to biopsy, we, we gave contrast, and you can see here that it's basically maybe enhancing just a little earlier than the rest of the liver, but then it becomes, you know, iso-dense in the portal venous phase and also in the delayed phase, and this was uh, proven to be focal fat on ultrasonic guide biopsy and as a subsequent MR as well. So now let's move on to uh, malignant lesions. Um, we'll first talk about hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, typically, these will have these are hypervascular with strong enhancement in the arterial phase. Uh, you may be able to see a basket of irregular arteries feeding the tumors from the outside. Very importantly, they will wash out, but their washout can be relatively slow and only start after 75 seconds. And the washout can be variable, so poorly differentiated HCC will tend to wash out earlier than well differentiated HCC. Uh, and rarely there is no washout, but that's very uncommon. And because they have this delayed washout, you really need to image the liver with contrast for up to five minutes. So this is an example from the literature, a hypervascular uh, mass with a large feeding vessel. Let me show you a couple examples we had. So this was a 27-year-old male who had this uh, very large uh, lobulated hypervascular mass on the MR. You can see that the mass is hypervascular in the arterial phase compared to the, of the, to the rest of the liver parenchyma. There is a large central scar. Um, and uh, so, you know, this, this would be suspicious for a fibrolamellar uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So this patient came for biopsies, and this is the uh, hepatic arterial phase prior to the uh, biopsy. So I'm just going to, again, advance a little bit. And you can see here the arterial phase of the contrast is coming in, and you can see you only see a part of the mass here, but you can clearly see that is hypervascular compared to the rest of the liver here. Okay, then in the, in the early portal venous phase, it's still enhancing, similar to the liver, maybe just a tad more than the liver. So we keep going. This is a still image here, so we'll keep going. And then on the Delayed, very delayed phase. This was as like after three minutes, you can see here that the rest of the liver is enhancing more than this this mass here. So there is some de enhancement, and that is why uh, you really have to be concerned about uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, and this was a fibrolamellar hepatocellular carcinoma when we did large quarter biopsies to this uh, to this mass. This is another example of subtle hepatocellular carcinoma. So uh, you can see it well on grayscale. There is this echogenic mass known as the hypoechoic rim here, which would make you worry that this is a malignant lesion. And then these are just selected images from a contrast enhance, enhancement. So this is the early phase, and you can see this subtle, here's the bulge here, and you can see this subtle uh, hyper, it's hypervascular, hyper-enhancing on the early phase. 
this kind of ISO enhancing on the you know early portal venous phase and on a very delayed phase, I had to wait till about four and a half to five minutes to see that there is some de-enhancement here. Again, here's a lesion and on the grayscale, on the contrast, you can see there is subtle de-enhancement, and this at biopsy was a moderately differentiated hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, an example, uh, another patient we had recently who has a, uh, it was a, he came from the emergency department, he had worsening ascites, you can see that he has cirrhosis, he has ascites, and he also had, you know, a what, what appeared to be a thrombus in the portal vein, so in these patients, of course, we have to decide, is this a tumor thrombus, is that bland thrombus, um, and it can be very difficult on grayscale, so we gave him contrast, and here's the portal vein here, so we'll see again, I'm going to advance a little bit. And here the contrast is coming in slowly in the portal vein. Here it is. Okay. And this is the arterial phase. And then the portal venous phase is filling. You can see there is a filling defect here. But if you look here, okay, this tumor thrombus, this is enhancing. So if this thrombus is enhancing, then this is actually a tumor thrombus. And you can see there is very heterogeneous enhancement of the liver parenchyma in this region, okay? And so you're really con very concerned that this patient has a kind of um, a multifocal diffuse hepatocellular carcinoma with a tumor thrombus. Uh, and in these patients, we recommend an AFP just to check that his AFP was elevated. Um, and so, you know, and then he decided to go for hospice care. This patient was unfortunately very sick, but so this presumably is a, you know, um, multifocal hepatocellular carcinoma with tumor thrombus that is very nicely demonstrated with contrast. And here's his, again, his CT, again, showing the enhancing thrombus in the portal vein here. Metastasis will have rapid washout in portal venous phase. So even, and because, because uh, metastases are supplied by the hepatic artery, even uh, hypovascular metastases oftentimes will have early transient peripheral hypervascularity in the early arterial phase. If they're hypervascular metastases, then they'll have early intense uh, enhancement. Again, the important thing is there'll be a washout in the portal venous phase, and usually it happens rapidly by 30 to 40, you know, 40 seconds. So um, this is an unfortunate young man who uh, came to the uh, emergency department because he was feeling poorly, and you can see from the CT scan why he was feeling poorly. He has a, a liver hypodense masses. He has a very large necrotic retroperitoneal mass here. He has big masses in the mediastinum as well as in the lung here. So he had a testicular ultrasound that basically showed no focal mass, but this, you know, many, many microlithiasis. And so he came to us for biopsy. And here's his, um, on the arterial face, you can see there is early intense rim enhancement of this mass. And so again, we biopsy the rim, the, the enhancing rim, and this was unfortunately metastatic choriocarcinoma. So uh, another example uh, where uh, this patient had metastatic breast cancer. Now in this patient, the lesions were really, really difficult to see. Uh, did, she was coming to us for biopsy on grayscale, and we are giving her contrast here. And you can see on the uh, portal venous phase, you can see here these hypodense masses. They're kind of subtle, but at least you see them. So we're going to be able to use this uh, to, the, to do the uh, our biopsy here. And again, um, so this is a patient. She had many, many lesions. They're somewhat, you can see them, but they're somewhat more difficult to see with grayscale. And we really use our map from the... Uh, contrast enhanced where they look hypodense in the portal venous phase compared with the liver to do the biopsy. And this was metastatic breast cancer. So in summary for the liver, uh, the washout is really, really very important because washout uh, is associated with malignancy. So if you have rapid washout, it, uh, metastatic disease usually, delayed washout, 
in hepatocellular carcinoma. And in this paper here, out of 147 hypervascular lesions, you had washout in 97% of malignant lesions. Uh, they had some, there is some overlap. They also saw washout in 36% of benign lesions, so some of which were abscesses or poconodular hyperplasia. And usually, importantly, a lack of washout in the portal venous and delayed phase usually indicates a benign lesions. Uh, most of these are ISO hyper-enhancing compared to the normal liver. So there are liver-specific limitations. If there are very deep lesions, uh, lesions high in the dome, they may be difficult to see on grayscale, and therefore the contrast will also be very limited. If the patient has marked hepatic steatosis, there is so much attenuation of the sound. Uh, waves that, uh, again, the contrast will not be very diff very good. Same if you have a small shrunken liver with limited uh, ultrasound window. Okay, so now I'm going to move on and talk about uh, renal applications. So again, uh, important to remember this is off-label use, so therefore we get informed consent with the patient. Uh, I, you know, it's very easy. You, I just tell the patient, well, you know, it's the same. It's approved for the liver. The contrast act exactly the same way. We're just going to put, put the probe on the kidney instead of the liver. And, you know, patients, uh, uh, you know, uh, readily agree. So what are the indications? Again, characterization of an indeterminate mass in patients who have renal insufficiency or contrast allergy or an indeterminate lesion on CT and MR when there is a single phase and we don't know if it's a hyperdense cyst or a, or a solid renal mass. It's also very useful for characterization of renal cystic masses or determining if a renal bulge is a normal column of protein, which was enhanced the same way as the rest of the kidney or it's a focal mass. Or we can use it to evaluate renal perfusion, possibly in transplant, for example, to detect potential infarcts, and again, just like in the liver, in preparation for ultrasound-guided biopsies. So what is the hemodynamics of contrast in the kidney? Well, you'll have rapid cortical enhancement in the arterial phase uh, from 20 to 40 seconds after the start of injection. That's a cortical medullary phase where the cortex is enhancing, but the medulla is still hypovascular. And then later on, from 40 to 120 seconds, there is filling in of the renal medulla, so you have a nephropathy phase when there is homogeneous enhancement of the entire renal parenchyma. Now remember, there is no excretory phase, unlike, unlike iodinated contrast, and the contrast washes out of the kidney after approximately three minutes. So basically, I image the kidney for three minutes. So here's a normal renal enhancement. Here's the kidney here, and we'll see the contrast coming in. You can see here the contrast coming in. So this is a cortical medullary phase where the renal pyramids are hypodense compared to the rest of the of the renal parenchyma. And then progressively, we're going to move to the uh, nephrographic phase where there is homogeneous enhancement of the entire renal parenchyma. And the only thing that we see that is not enhancing is the collecting system and the renal sinus fat. So that's normal. So a very, very good application is in a patient just like this, is this lesion that was detected on a grayscale ultrasound in a patient who had renal failure and was in the cardiac unit, is this a complex cyst or is it a solid mass? And so this was very easy to do. Actually, uh, you can do it portably, which is a big advantage. We went to the uh, cardiac unit and this is the early phase. And this is the late phase. You can see here the renal parenchyma is enhancing. And you see there is absolutely no enhancement of the internal content of this lesion. And therefore, this confirms that this is a complicated cyst. And it is actually more elegant and faster to do than an MR. This patient had a non-contrast MR. And again, the MR was actually indeterminate. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why they did the MR, because we told them you didn't need to do this. This really gives you a very elegant and quick answer. As opposed to this patient. So this patient on MR has this complex uh, looking cystic lesion. Uh, again, this patient did, could not have um, contrast because uh, he had chronic renal disease. And if I start this uh, uh, video clip again. Here's a contrast coming in. This is the liver, actually. You see the mass here, and you can see here that there is enhancement of this solid component. Here's the kidney. Here's the enhancement. 
Okay, so it's also helpful because we were then able to target directly the solid enhancing component of the cystic mass, and we were able to prove with biopsy that this was a renal cell carcinoma, likely a papillary renal cell carcinoma, uh, was uh, how it was signed out on, on pathology. So there are some limitations, however, in large lesions. So this is a patient who had a very, very large mass in his right kidney. He also, he already had a left nephrectomy for renal cell carcinoma, but the cystic mass in his right kidney was, enhanced, was enlarging. He had an elevated creatinine, so you have a very ugly-looking mass here with all this solid, you know, this solid appearing component. So when we give him contrast, uh, you can see these are selected images from the contrast. There is no enhancement of this portion. So basically, this is just debris or blood. Um, and so the patient also had a CT, however. And on CT, again, you can see the internal content of the cystic lesion much better on ultrasound. But what we did not see on ultrasound is that there was a tiny, tiny component of nodule enhancement. Here's in, it is in the arterial phase, here it is in the coronal. Uh, so, you know, this, this could be a, a you know, a, a cystic lesion with a tiny renal cell carcinoma, possibly, uh, because of his renal condition. So we call this at least a Bosniak thesis. Because of this condition, he was just followed, and at least this lesion, as well as this nodule, was stable at six-month follow-up. Now, for solid renal masses, uh, they will um, they will have different enhancement compared to the renal point chemo and at least on one phase because remember uh, they don't have a normal nephron. Uh, if it's the classic clear cell renal cell carcinoma, you'll see a hyper enhancement in the arterial phase. The papillary renal cell carcinoma, just like on MR and CT, will be an e hypo enhancing early. Look for pseudocapsule. Uh, there's some challenges. It's difficult to differentiate other solid masses such as um, angiomyolipoma, who can have slow washing and washout, and oncocytoma. So here is an example of a 62-year-old male with an elevated creatinine. He has this very large mass arising from the right kidney here. You can see here this mass in the lower pole of the right kidney. So at the time of biopsy, we gave him contrast. And again, we knew this was necrotic, so you can see that there is hypervascular enhancement of the periphery of the lesion, but the center is necrotic, so we were able to just biopsy, again, the periphery to make sure that we could get good viable material. And this was a classic renal cell, clear cell carcinoma. This is a small echogenic mass. So here it is, you know, somewhat difficult to see on the grayscale. And we'll see on the arterial phase, just look here as the contrast arrives. Here it comes, and you can see here that there is early and transient hypervascularity of that mass, okay? So it's, it's very subtle, but it's there. And so this, again, was a classic clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Now, in this patient, there is a hypoenhancing mass with some calcification in the right kidney. Here it is on grayscale, and with Contrast, I just give you selected images in the arterial phase, uh, um, the corticomedullary phase, uh, the, the more vena, uh, nephrographic phase here is hypo enhancing. Here's you know, a biopsy um, here, and this was a chromophobe renal cell carcinoma, who, which was hypo enhancing on the arterial phase compared to the rest of the renal parenchyma. Another example, very large mass in the center of the kidney. You can see it's hypoenhancing on the CT. The arterial phase of mass is here on grayscale. And again, multiple selected images show that the, this is the, the mass is hypoenhancing even you know, compared to the rest of the kidney. And this was a papillary renal cell carcinoma. So there are other potential uh, GU applications. You can uh, potentially use contrast to look for acute pyronephritis. 
uh, to uh, identify renal abscesses or infarcts. Uh, it has been used uh, to evaluate transplant perfusion, uh, planning for biopsy, as just I showed you. And finally, uh, it is approved to look for reflux uh, in our children, in this case, of course, you inject contrast within the bladder and look to see if there is reflux of contrast within the ureters. So some, uh, some other applications uh, that have been described in the literature, so preparation for biopsy or ablation, looking for enhancing components, you can do that in any kind of tumor. And you know it's also helpful for follow-up after ablation because you should let left of enhancement of of the, tum uh, of the tumor if it has been properly ablated. Uh, it has also been used for inflammatory bowel disease such as Crohn's disease to look for active, dis active inflammation. So this is just an example of a uh, patient who had a very large, uh, unfortunate woman, which had a young woman with this very large mass in the abdomen. And again, prior to biopsy, because we want to make sure that we want to minimize the number of biopsies we do and, and, and get our best uh, map for where we should get uh, the core biopsies. Uh, we look for enhancement in this lesion, and you can see again, here's the, on the, the contrast coming in. And again, a peripheral uh, enhancement, uh, so we use this area to, to do, obtain our core biopsies, and this was a GIST tumor at biopsy and then at subsequent surgery. I've also used it in the spleen. You know, really, you can use it for soft tissue tumors, et cetera. Um, uh, this is mostly for research purposes, but you can do a quantitative analysis where you do time intensitive curve, where you pl place a uh, region of interest in the uh, tumor as well as the adjacent organ, and you can compare the enhancement of the tumor with the rest of the organ. So this was a, the, uh, the fibrolamellar hepatocellular carcinoma I showed you earlier. And in the liver, you can see there is earlier enhancement compared to the liver and then the enhancement. So in conclusion then, uh, ultrasound contrast is really a powerful tool in, in well-selected cases. There are some obstacles. First of all, the limitation of ultrasound. Um, also, practice patterns, at least in the United States, so, you know, reflexively people will order CT or MR and don't think about ultrasound contrast. I think, uh, you know, ultrasound communities really uh, are uh, obligation to educate our clinician to the potential of this technique and their issues with cost and reimbursement. And I thank you very much for your attention.